Welcome back to the clock shop, folks. I apologize for not uploading uh, a video. It's been a long time. Uh, I've had a lot of projects I'm working on here. I just finished one I wanted to bring you in on. Let me turn you around and we'll show it to you. Okay, folks, we have a, a Hershey clock here from the 1950s. This is a 9-2 model. You can see here, if you count the hammers, you're going to get nine hammers here. You have the chime hammers back here. Uh, then you have the strike hammer over here to uh, count the hour strike. Now, this one's been fully restored. Uh, there were several bushings in here. Somebody had gotten in there and rebushes before, so it had been worked on once before. But some of those bushings um, were worn out. This has been so long ago that it had been worked on. I didn't have time to do this as a video as I was restoring it. I'm a little pressed for time to get this done. And uh, having to record the entire process would have would, it would have been a really lengthy video too. I have another one over here that uh, we'll walk over here. I'll show you too, which I uh, I may do in the future as a video as I restore. You can see how dirty and ugly that one is. This one is a two weight Hershey. Hershey made two different styles. They made a two weight one. This was an older one here. It looks like, and then they made the three weight model, which we see over here. Now, these are a little tricky when you go to restore them because you see all the levers here on the front. I have my little flashlight here to help accentuate them. This is the strike rack over here along with its gathering pallet and the rack hook here. Over here we have the chime side again with the gathering pallet. You can see the gathering pallet. Let me see if I can zoom in on that a little bit. Get a nice close up. The gathering pallet's a little bit different, a different look to it. It's offset. We'll bring you back over here to the strike side. You see that's the strike gathering pallet. So there's differences with the gathering pallet. So make sure you don't mix these two up when you go to, to reassemble everything. Now it's very important that you polish these levers here. And we'll go over some of the places where you want to polish uh, here. Let me get a pointer here. Let's see what I have here. Oh, here. I'm going to put the flashlight down. Um, this post here where the gather pallet rests, you want to polish that. Basically, anything where the levers kind of contact each other or rub, this part, I actually polish this. This works as the warning stop for the uh, strike side so when it comes up on the hour. I'll show you how it functions in a minute. Uh, this will, though right now it's in the mode that allows the strike to function. You can see if you follow it up here, it goes up here. And then this would block the warning wheel on the strike side when this chime rack is dropped. So when it's chiming, which you can see just drop right there, it's starting to drop anyway, it's coming up on the half past. Um, this will be released. You can see it was released now. When it's when the rack is, is all the way gathered up, it pulls this down. Let me, let me bring this back out here. And this pulls this lever down to release the strike side so the strike can, can function after the hour chiming is done. Now as I was as I was saying before, it's important that you polish this point here. This is another one here you want to polish this little knob here and underneath the lever I, I polish that. I use my polishing wheels. Let me grab one of those here for you. Here they are in here. I use these for my uh, pivots also to do the pivots. You can see you focus in on that if it will. Come on focus, focus, focus. If I can get it to focus. There we go. And I use these in a Dremel tool. And this is what you can use to polish the levers on all the levers here on the, the Hershey clock. Um, now, the way this function, I'm going to bring this down to the half pass. Let me bring this back so you can see the whole picture here. And we're going to turn our hands, hands around to the half past. And you can see the gathering going around there. It's picking up the teeth. It dropped two teeth since it was on the half past. 
and that gives you just the right amount of time to give you the proper sequence uh, for the half hour. Let's bring it up to the quarter of. It's going to drop one more teeth, so you're going to have three teeth that are dropped. We'll release that. I'll bring you up here to the chime hammer so you can see see how they function here. Bring it to the side here. This particular model is, uh, I think it's two chimes. Actually, it might be three chimes. Let me see. I'll look at the dial here. Yeah, it's three chimes you have. You can see there, Whittington, Westminster, and Canterbury. And I should have known that because we have, if you look on the barrel itself, there are actually three sets of pins. Let me go back to my pointer here. You look closely here at the pins on the barrel. There's one, two, three right next to each other. The barrel shifts over back and forth. This is what engages the different teeth, pins I should say, to uh, so you can have your different chimes. There's a lever actually on the dial that actually moves this back and forth. When the dial is on, this would function. So that's how you get your chime selection. Now you can see there's a couple different things here with these clocks. Uh, they're a little different maybe than other clocks. One thing is the chime correcting mechanism, which is, let me get my pointer again. Sorry about the camera, I know I'm all crooked here. This is the chime correcting mechanism right here. And the way this works, I'm gonna bring it up to the hour so you can observe how it works here. Of course, this will drop four teeth for the chime to give you your full sequence. Now, if you look over to the left, you can watch the strike. And there goes your strike rack. That's going to drop for the hour. Now, once again, this lever here has been released. And it's blocking now the strike warning wheel, which is I can bring it around here on this side, maybe. Don't know if you were able to see that. But the strike warning wheel has a pin on it, which is being blocked right now. So it will not strike, at least until the chime is done. So we'll bring it up here. Keep a close eye on this here, this and this little pin right here. There's a pin on the, on the barrel. Notice how it's hooked right here. Right now, that rack hook is, is raised up and out of the way. It's not even laying against the rack. It's caught by this hook right here. Now let's say start it. You can see immediately drops it because this hook is being released by this pin. If this barrel were out of sequence, being the chime was out of sequence, this would continue to go until that hook was released by that pin. This is the way, and there goes your, your hour strike. You can see here. That's going there. Uh, and that I'll actually demonstrate that for you. I'll actually turn the hands around. We'll give it a chi chance to chime on the quarter after. So let's go ahead and do that. So all the way to the half past. And they're going to be chiming the wrong sequence of notes here. You, of course, can't tell that because there's no tubes. Tubes are left at the customer's house, by the way. There, There's no need for me to bring those. We'll bring it up here to the quarter of... Once again, our chime sequence is going to be off. It's going to be chiming the wrong sequence of, of notes. But it will quickly correct itself, as you'll see in a moment here. Let's bring it up. Now, here's where we want to get the correction. We'll bring it up to the hour. Notice how that's going to hook. Let me bring the camera in on it. That raises up, it up a little higher than the other quarters. And in doing so, that rack hook now is cooked in that hook and you see you will not let it drop. So now it's stuck up, you can see it? This pin has to come around. Once it does, it releases the rack hook. Now your, your proper sequence will start, but it will continue to run until that happens. So the sequence will always be correct once that function has is, is been engaged. You see, now we have our hour strike, counting the hour. 
There's our snail down there, as you can see. Now on these clocks, like some other ones, some other German um, uh, Westminster chime, or not Westminster, but triple chime perhaps, or even Westminster, the hour hand you can move. And you can see as you move the hour hand, it moves the snail with it. It actually is a pin. But you can see maybe right down there on the underside of the uh, underside of the hour hand. So you can move this hour hand independently to set the time. Suppose you want to go forward or backward three or four hours. You can do that just by moving the hour hand. And then go ahead and set the time as you would with a minute hand. You can see also there's a limiting screw here. This is for the the second wheel here. I should say the first wheel in the chime train. And there's one on the back of the movement too. This limits the end play of this wheel here so it engages properly to this uh, wheel here, the crown wheel that goes up to the uh, barrel. So that's something you need to have a little bit of play by screwing these screws. And you can do in and out a little bit to a certain extent to get your depth thing proper here on this this wheel here, right here. That thing has to be correct on that. You have to have some, some play here. No binding, you can't have that bind anywhere. Or else the clock will, uh, the chime may stall out, then you'll be being called back to the customer's house. Now once again, you know, you have to be careful of all the polish you, you gotta do on these. And I actually put a small amount of grease too on certain, some of these surfaces, here, like here, where the gabber lays against the pin on the rack. I put a little bit of grease on that. Other, other surfaces where the, the levers might meet, just to give a, a little bit of a, of fric you know, frictionless operation, so to speak, or, or have it you know operate more smoothly. Well, one thing I do not like about these early Hershey clocks is the, the set-off mechanism, which is down here. Now, you can see as, as I turn the hands around, you can see as it pushes this lever up, squeezes it up, in other words. And that, it, that lever rests against this pin here. Now I made sure this pin was very highly polished too. Again, we need to polish this lever here, both sides, this side, this side. This has been a problem point here with the early Hershey clocks. And I kind of have a story to tell you on that. The gentleman that uh, taught me clock repair many years ago at one time his name was Nicholas A. Valley he was head of the Wanamaker clock department for a number of years in Philadelphia and they sold a lot of these Hershey clocks in the 50s 60s 70s and um, they noticed that there was an issue with this lever here the way it squeezed its way up instead of a nice, nice smooth lifting motion and when once this got worn a little bit rough it sometimes would stop the clock. So what they did was they actually soldered another portion on down here, which sort of maybe formed a T, which the pin, the lever then, which with the, the pin when it came around, would then push this lever, not squeeze it up, but just lift it up at the bottom of the T. Hershey got wind of this and sent their engineers out to Wanamakers to observe the what they did. Later on, and I'll throw a, a splash screen up as to what the design was changed to. But the Hershey later changed their design based on what Nick and his group was doing down there at the uh, at Wanamaker's. Now when Nick passed on some years ago, his family actually gave me a lot of his tools and a lot of his parts and boxes and things. And I discovered here in one of his boxes, you can see here's these Hershey levers here. Looks like he had replaced maybe a number of them. When Hershey supplied these new parts, they went ahead and started replacing them on their clocks. And you can see I have a number of these here. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. They're all, there's a number of them here in this, this box. Well, that looks what I'm talking uh, about, like what I'm talking about there. This looks like an, maybe an early example of of what the, they were experimenting with. But later on, the um, Hershey Company adopted this design. As you can see, instead of the, the pin squeezing, let me see if I can get this up here. 
I'm working with one hand here. The pin actually lifts up here on the bottom. Hopefully you can see that. Instead of squeezing and pushing up in this, in this manner, it actually pushes up here on the bottom. So the lever gets pushed up like that. And I'll grab another one here. This is the old design here. You can see the pin sort of rides up here just and then squeezes it up as the pin goes by which is not a smooth of a motion and can introduce some friction causing it to possibly stall out but anyway that's the story of, of how Hershey he changed his design uh, on what Nick and his group was doing down there at Wanamaker's the clock department of modern makers is very well known here in the area of Philadelphia. They sold a lot of high-end clocks and timepieces to uh, a lot of folks along the main line and other areas. The main line is a, an area which is known to be somewhat affluent. It's a it's an area of old money. It, it, the main line is gets its name from the the train tracks that ran all the way from Philadelphia out west, and all along there was called the main line. All the cities that grew up there was called the main line. Well, the little well, towns, I should say. I grew up what was, was called the main line. So anyway, I digress. Um, this is the, um, the uh, one more thing I wanted to say was when you clean this, uh, I had to take this all apart up here. This barrel assembly here all comes off, comes apart. Uh, in here, there are little pieces of leather underneath this, this brass plate here, this brass strip, I should say. Uh, you make sure you pop those little pieces of leather out. The, the levers actually kind of rest against those and it, it sort of a, avoids bouncing. The bouncing isn't as pronounced because it gives the lever a soft spot to land on. So it kind of inhibits the bouncing and maybe even any, any kind of noise that are clicking noise that might occur, you know, without that. So make sure you pop those little pieces of leather, they're tiny, out so you don't get them through the cleaner because it'll harden them and and it it'll mess them up. It won't. Uh, they won't have the the soft functionality that they're supposed to have. If you put this through the cleaner afterward, you can then pop them back in. If you damage them while removing them, you can just replace them. Just buy some leather belting and cut it down to size and cut it so that it fits in. It's like a little hole that it sits in here. I wish I had uh, had filmed some of this while I was restoring it. Um, next time I will. I, like I said, I'll. I'll Film the other one, and you'll get the chance to walk through the entire process on that. Now, I also did replace the hammer leathers here. You can see the faces. These deteriorate, and all they are is basically a thin leather. Now, I use this stuff here, and let me dig it out of my bag here for you. I guess I can find it where I put it. I got a bag of leather. Here it is here. That's what I use. It's a, you can see how the, how thin it is. It's got to be the. Let me try to get this to focus there. Let me go over here with it. It's really not that well in focus. Anyway, you can see how it's 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 got to be the right thickness. It can't be too thin, or else she'll have. Uh, it'll, the sound will, will sound too harsh, but it can't be too thick either. Also, it'll be it'll be too too mellow. And w what I do is I just basically cut round. You can see I cut one out there just recently to put on that. You can use the uh, size of the original once you take the pop the original out. These just come apart. These hammers here just come apart. And let me just take one apart here for you. All right, we'll take this one off here. Of course, a large screwdriver does help. And you can see how these separate. I usually put this in a vise just to kind of hold it steady. You can see this threaded portion here. Just turn that out. And that's it. Just a little 
little circle of leather there. We'll stick it back in. Need to get it positioned properly here. That's what you do, just to replace the uh, leather faces. We'll tighten this back down. I find it helps to hold my finger against it. And we'll just put it back in the vise and give it a good couple of turns here so it's nice and tight. There. Want that to protrude through. Put this back on. And that's it. Now you notice these uh, little knobs right here. They can be used to adjust the tension. Turning them in will push the bottom of this spring loaded strip in and create more tension on the hammer so that it may strike the uh, the tube a little harder maybe making a slightly louder sound you don't want to go too far with that though you can create so much tension that you can stall the chime out so right about there I mean you can see they're, they're set differently this one here is turned way in in fact I may back out on that one a little bit there. You can experiment with that a little bit to get to a point where it's not anywhere near stalling the movement. Of course when you're in the person's house that's when you're going to really hear it. You know whether it needs to be adjusted or not you can do it at that time. Uh, one other thing I want to mention is the uh, the cabling here, the weight cable which I always of course replace those. Uh, I use normal tall case cable like the way I use with, with Dell Strike tall cases but the length of this is different. It's not 10 feet like you would find uh, normally find with most bell strike movements it's actually eight foot and I have my bench here is five foot long I've measured it out so I have it marked so if I want to do um, a cable for a bell strike clock I'll just run the cable back and forth twice here and then cut it but with the for the Hershey clocks I'll just run it over through once and then double back to, you can see I have eight foot right here. It's, it's actually right, scribed right there. So uh, that's where I'll cut it. So I'll know it's going to be eight foot. Sometimes you have to tweak it a little bit. This one I may have to maybe increase. This one looks like it's fine on this side because I don't. You know, it, it's it's just filling up the barrel as it's wound all the way up. But the other ones are starting to come up a little bit on the on the ratchet portion as I fully wind it. And that's not what you want. You don't want that to interfere with the ratchet. So, well, all you do is, the reason why I make these type of knots here is you can just take and double it one more time in this type of a knot to take up some more of the, the cable. Probably just once is all I'll have to do for the strike cable and the time cable. So they should be fine the way they are, but they are starting to ride up a little bit as it winds it up fully. If the customer never winds it up fully, it'd never be an issue. But, you know, you can't be sure of that, so... We'll take care of that before I send it back to the customer's house. All right, folks. Well, I hope this helps you out. If you do have to uh, do a clock like this and you find yourself, uh, you know, faced with overhauling a Hershey clock, they are fairly complicated. They're, they're certainly not for a novice to, to tackle. Um, I've done quite a few of these, so I've gotten quite used to them, and, and I know kind of most, pretty much all the nuances on, on them. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, oh, by the way, I want to say I did leave off I do have the lever here that goes here, what you see here. Uh, this is for the, the strike and, and chime shut off, and they engage with the uh, behind the dial. I don't put them on right now because I'm testing, and they may interfere with the dropping of the racks. But once I'm ready to put the dial on, I'll just put those, those levers on there, actually right here in the bin. Uh, so well, you know, once that's ready to put the dial on, like I said, I'll, I'll put those those two levers on and then we'll test it some more. But I'm going to give this a good long test time, at least a week, to make sure there's no issues and make sure this lever is nice and polished enough that it doesn't cause any stalling at all at the, at the time. Sometimes if it gets caught, in, like I said, if there's a rough point spot there, the clock could stall out and just stop and may lose power. 
Uh, hopefully that's not the case. I don't think it will in this case because it is highly polished. All right, folks. We're going to call this a uh, wrap here. As, like I said, as always, uh, if you have any questions, drop them down in the comments. So I'll be happy to answer whatever I can. Folks, so we'll see you in the next video. Take care. Be safe. Bye-bye.